my daughter and I were driving through um, Chester County, Pennsylvania, and there was a little cemetery called St. James Cemetery, and it was very slushy and, and kind of chilly out, like you could kind of sense that there was a thaw happening. Um, and, and my kids know that I really like to take photos in cemeteries, so we had some time, we pulled over, um, and uh, my daughter, who's a teenager, was like, oh, I'm playing this video game on my phone, so um, I'll come out and I'll be out there in a few minutes and, you know, take some photos with you. So I'm like, okay. Um, so I ventured into the little cemetery myself. We were parked um, kind of like in an alcove um, next to the cemetery gate. So alongside the road, but um, in front of the cemetery gate. So um, she hung out in the car while I went into the cemetery myself. Now, um, like I said, things were starting to thaw out. There had been snow like probably like several days before and the ground was pretty like smushy and, and wet. Um, and you know, the snow and the ice were all like dripping from the trees. So it was chilly, um, but not like freezing cold. Um, so I had my phone and I was just going around taking some pictures. Um, it was a cloudy, dreary day, so it just seemed like the perfect setting for photos in a little old cemetery. So, um, so I came upon one part um, in particular that um, said Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. So I was taking pictures of it. Um, there were little stones um, piled on it and pennies and things of that nature. And you could see it's this giant stone slab that's just kind of over this giant hole in the earth, like in the ground. So I kind of like, you know, leaned forward and tried to look behind it to see if there was any kind of door under it or a stone under it. And there's really not. It's just this open hole that they have put this huge stone over that says, you know, Tomb of the Fallen Soldier or Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. Sorry. Um, so I took a few pictures of it and I turned my back to it. Um, and I was in a squatting position trying to get um, a picture of um, a tombstone that was kind of older. Um, and it's just adjacent to the, the tomb of the unknown soldier. But um, I, so I had my back to it, squatting down, starting to take a picture. And um, I feel someone yank on my hoodie and it was hard enough that I kind of almost fell onto my butt and I kind of, you know, regained my balance and stood up and turned around thinking that I was going to find my teenager there, my daughter. Um, I turned around and there was no one there, which I was just like, um, okay. So then I'm thinking, where did she go? Like, I'm thinking that she yanked on me and thought it was funny. And then, you know, went behind one of the, the tombs or the trees that are in this little cemetery. But as I looked around, I kind of rounded um, the corner of this mausoleum. And I see my daughter is still sitting in the car on her phone playing her game. Um, at that point, I got kind of freaked out. Um, and I walked back to the car and I sat down in the car and she said, are you done already? And I said, well, let me explain what happened. So I told her all about it, told her how I took a few pictures, saw this tomb of the unknown soldier, took a few pictures of that, turned my back to it, squatted down, you know, balancing on my feet, um, to take a picture of a different tombstone and I thought she yanked on my hoodie and she was just floored. So she quickly ended her game. We went back out into the cemetery. So we're walking around. I showed her where I had been standing. We're kind of hovering around that area and um, I squat back down and I try to show her what I was doing and I said, you know, um, this is what I did and I tried to take a picture and when I did that, my phone shut off. <laughs> completely shut down. At the time I had um, almost 60% battery life and I just thought, okay, that's really bizarre.
my phone just turned itself off. I can't get it to turn back on. And when I push um, the button, the home button, um, it would just flash at me that I need to plug my phone in. So Autumn said, okay, here, take my phone, use my phone. Same thing happened. So I try to take a picture and her phone turns itself off. With hers, I was able to turn it back on. So we try again and her phone turns itself back off. So at this point, we're like, okay, we're done. <laughs> it's time to go home. So we get back to the car, which is still in front of the cemetery gate alongside the road. Um, and I plug in my phone and I wait for it to power back on. And it just kept flashing that I needed to plug it in. So I made sure, you know, everything was connected. I got the phone to come back on. And as soon as I did, it turned itself back off. And the same thing happened um, repeatedly with my daughter's phone. And when it would come back on, my phone would say it was at like 56% or something. My daughter's phone would say it was at like 19%. So hers was far less, but mine was still over, you know, half its battery life. So my first thought was, I didn't think it was that cold outside to make the battery drain that quickly. And, um, you know, when we got to the car, every time it would try to power on, it would show that we still had some battery life, but then the phone would turn itself back off. <laughs> so at some point, my daughter's like, we just got to go. We got to get away from this place. So we drove down the street. We parked at a florist that was closed and I plugged the phone in again. And we weren't even a mile up the road away from the cemetery. But by the time we got up the street and turned the phone back on with it being plugged in the same way we had sitting in front of the cemetery gate, the phone came on no problem. It showed that my battery was at almost 60%. It showed that hers was at like 18 or 19%, whatever it was. Um, so it was just very strange. Uh, we have since been back to the cemetery. Uh, we brought my other daughter, my other teenager with us uh, for this trip and some of their friends. And we didn't have anything strange happen, <laughs> much to their disappointment. Um, but yeah, it was just a very, very odd. And I just, out of the blue, didn't expect it. I don't know why it happened. I don't know if it was the particular um, headstone or the person there that I was trying to take a picture of, um, but it was just really odd because it happened to both of our phones um, and, and neither of them would come back on until we actually left. My name is Andrea. I live in Northeast Tennessee right across the state line from where my parents live in a haunted house in Southwest Virginia. My story tonight is just to share some things that myself and my parents, family members have experienced in that house, which was built in, I think in 1900 or shortly thereafter. So it's um, a little over a hundred years old. Um, the town is a bit of a historic town with a little bit of a reputation for being haunted and there's also uh, some local lore and legends surrounding a famous, notorious, infamous outlaw that we're going to call Johnny and it just so happens that Johnny's brother lived in the house that my parents live in so it became a place for this outlaw to hide out from the police. Um, and where they would have drinking and gambling and so on and so forth. So we feel like that might have a little bit to do with some of the strange goings on that happen in the home, which mostly it's, it's a very active house. Um, things are, there's usually something that happens every month, every other week or so. Um, it's usually a lot of small things or just sounds, the sound of someone coming in through the back door and walking through the kitchen and into the dining area. Um, things being, you know, like there might be a little decorative item that always sits on the mantle and then one day my parents will notice that it's not there, go looking for it, can't find it anywhere. A day or two later, it's right back there. Um, other objects getting lost um, from their usual spots. 
um, like my mom's wedding rings, for example, always she always keeps them in a dish on her dresser when she's not wearing them and she's went to get them before and they've been gone and they haven't been able to find them for quite some time and then they'll turn up on right back in the dish so things like that another kind of funny recurring thing that happens is um when my mom goes to get in the shower and she takes all of the clothes that she's going to put in on after she gets out of the shower on a shelf in the bathroom then she'll go to put them on and her socks will be missing or another small article of clothing and this has happened so many times that now she goes through everything and double checks and makes sure that she has everything and every couple of weeks this happens to her um, she'll go to put on her socks and the socks are not there. She'll go into her bedroom and the socks will be laying on the bed or the dresser. Something, things like that happen quite often. So some of the bigger things that have happened in the house, my mom has felt someone walk up behind her and put her, their hand on her shoulder and turned and looked and no one's been there. She has restless legs, so she often um, is unable to sleep in her bed or has to get up at night and kind of walk or go into the living room and or in another spare bedroom that we have she has a couple of recliners that she will go and try to sleep in those so that she can you know be sitting upright and have her legs propped up she's been in the recliner before and had someone come up and shake her gently shake her shoulder like they're shaking her awake or just lay their hand on her shoulder she's been up at night and heard someone walk through the house and walk up right up beside of her one time it was so distinct like every sound she heard when you um the back door open it goes into like a little like laundry room and then another door from there into the kitchen she distinctly heard the sound of both doors heard someone walk in through the kitchen into the dining room walk right over beside her and it was so distinct that she really thought that someone had come into the house and my dad was in the bed their bed asleep and she was so frightened that she was just frozen and she said that she eventually had thought to herself I can't just keep sitting here I am going to have to turn around and confront whoever just walked into my home and there was no one there and she got up and looked around the house got my dad up he w and went and looked upstairs and no one was there um, and all the doors were still locked as they had left them so we have also come to believe that this ghost or whatever it is that dwells there with them has also done things to um, warn them when something's about to happen. There was an incident. My parents have been prim somewhat primary caretakers of my niece and nephew for most of their lives. And there have been some situations, ongoing situations that have been every now and then for years with um, in with those children's lives. And a lot of things that have happened we feel have been connected to the children and it's like the ghost there has tried to warn the family about things. There was a toy remote control car that was really old that had belonged to my brother when he was a kid and when my nephew was about three or four years old um, my parents let him have it to play with and he wanted to get it to work so badly and they just my dad tried everything he could to get it to work new batteries you know kind of had it checked out a bit and tried you know whatever needed to, he felt like needed repaired on it or whatever to get the car to work and they never could get it to work but they let him just play with it anyways he was happy to just kind of sit in the floor and scoot it around well, one night, uh, my dad was gone to the grocery store, my mom was home alone, and she heard this horrible sound um, coming from the spare bedroom where all the toys were. She went in there to see what's going on, and this car was on, and it was in a basket, and turned on its upside down, and the wheels were just spinning on it really fast. The All the sound effects were just going off on it the lights little flash the headlights or whatever my mom had a hard time getting it turned off 
the little remote to it wasn't being no buttons were being pushed on it nothing like that when my mom picked it up and you know messed with she got it to turn off and it never would work again after that um shortly after that incident they got a phone call about my nephew and he had been taken to the emergency room and my mom just said she just had this really strong feeling that that car going off like that had a connection to my nephew like something was trying to tell her to be prepared or that something just wasn't right with him and that was probably six or seven years ago when that happened there have been some ongoing issues with the children and just within the last few weeks a very similar thing happened again with my a toy um, army tank that my nephew has did the same thing now it it's worked before you know it's a, a newer toy that does work and you turn it off and on it had fairly new you know batteries in it um, my mom heard a noise, went into the room, and the tank was doing the same thing as the car. And then the next day, um, my parents got a phone call saying that there was an incident involving um, the children again. So we, a few other somewhat similar things have happened um, surrounding the kids' toys and then getting a phone call like that. Another incident, something happened, I can't remember if it was uh, something being pushed off of a table and breaking. I can't, it's hard to keep track because so many things have happened. And then my parents got some bad news about a friend of my dad's um, being involved in a car accident passing away. I was the first person to experience haunting there. Um, my parents moved in and to this house in August of 2010, and I actually moved in with them at that time and lived there for less than a year. The first thing that happened, we hadn't lived there very long, and upstairs of the house is kind of like my domain. I had a large bedroom up there. When you get to the top of the stairs, it's just kind of an open area around the banister. And of course, there's the rails that you could lean over and look down the stairwell and look into the living room downstairs. And I had um, chairs set up there, bookshelves, and I just kind of made it a little sitting area to hang out and read. And there are a couple of other rooms up there. And then my large bedroom and I kept all the doors to those other rooms closed and just left my bedroom door open all the time just it just made it cooler up there and one evening we all would have gone to bed and I went up there and lay down in my room we turned off the lights had the door open and I heard this distinctive it sounded like um, an old man making this kind of like groaning sound and an el like an elderly gentleman and I thought even though my dad is not an el elderly gentleman it did not sound like him and I was just kind of confused at first but then I thought well God, I better like check and make sure that he didn't get up and something has happened to him so I kind of got up and leaned over the banister walked out into the little foyer area leaned over the banister and looked to see if I could see my dad downstairs and called out for him and he wasn't no one was down there so I walked downstairs and looked around no one's down there I went down the hallway to the my parents bedroom and knocked on the door and asked if they were okay and they were fine they were in bed and it's like okay well I thought I just thought I heard something went back to bed and that was we'd only lived in the house maybe a week or two at that point and then very shortly after that I was sitting out on the front porch reading and the porch light turned off so I thought my parents just didn't know that I was out there or they forgot that I was out there so I um, opened the door went over to where the light switch is and said, hey, guys, don't turn the light off because I'm going to stay out here for a while. I'm still outside. And they looked at me and they're like, we didn't turn the light off. And I said, well, someone turned the light off. I had to, you know, I just flipped the switch and turned it back on. And they were like, are you sure? Are you sure it just didn't get dark and you didn't, you know, just didn't notice? And I'm like, no, the light was on. I saw it go off. And they were, we didn't do that. So we all thought that was really odd. Another thing that makes it so odd is that this particular light switch, it looks just like any other switch, 
you can tell that it's older from the plate and the actual switch, but it's a hard, you don't, you couldn't just walk, you know how like when you walk in or out of a room, you can just reach out in passing and just slap a light switch on or off. So you really have to like flip it up. And when you do, it makes a loud click sound. Um, that was odd. That was the second thing that happened there. And I, that was my experience also. And then I really haven't, oh, I'd have another experience where I went over to visit my parents and they had just got home from a little mini vacation they took to Charleston. And they'd unpacked and everything and had one of the suitcases, it was actually a suitcase of mine, um, at the bottom of the stairs. And it was empty, so I just volunteered and said, I'll, I'll carry this upstairs and put it away for you. And so I was walking upstairs. There are no light. It's dark outside. There were no lights on up there, but I could still see well enough because of the lights from downstairs shining up, the light coming in from the street light, and the back porch light through the window. And when I got up the stairs to the point to where I could look over to my left, to the closet door that's there through the rails of the banister, I noticed that the closet door was cracked open a little bit and it was slowly starting to open. And I stopped walking and just looked at it. And when I did, it stopped moving. And I thought, well, you know, maybe just my eyes playing tricks on me because it is kind of dark up here. And I decided to slowly walk on up the stairs and I kept my eye on that the whole time. And as I would start to move forward, it would start to move open again. And I was like, okay, my eyes are playing tricks on me or my movement, you know, it's some kind of optical illusion. So I really started to pay attention to how wide that opening was and everything. And I thought, okay, I'm gonna go on up. But the door, it did, it did. I, I got, it, it started to just slowly open and kept opening a bit as if someone were opening that door for me so that I could go in there and put the suitcase away. And that really creeped me out because that was the first time I felt like whatever ghost was there, it definitely wasn't just some residual thing or some kind of strange energy, whatever. It was definitely something of that had an intelligence about it. It had an awareness and was actually observant of us and what we were doing and I'm not sure why that really bothered me but it did it just kind of creeped me out and I told I came back downstairs and I'm not really one to be frightened of such things I have always been fascinated by ghosts and hauntings the occult different things like that all my life like I was a spooky kid <laughs> so um you know, it kind of unnerved my parents a bit, but it unnerved me. I told them, I was like, I'm just not going to go up there right now. Typically, I'm the one who's like, oh, yes, something weird is happening. I'm going to, I want to see this. I want to experience this. But that just, it just bothered me um, for some reason. So that happened. It was another one of my experiences. And then this past spring, it was the night before the spring equinox, um, right before everything in our area really started to go into big lockdown. When they first started telling people because of COVID, um, my parents and I spent, I think, two or three days making sure that we all and our family members had everything that we were going to need so, so that we didn't have to leave the house for two weeks. We went, you know, all that grocery shopping and everything. And then when we all was said and done, I decided to spend the night with them, um, me and my little boy, um, before we really went into lockdown. Because um, I thought, I don't know when I'm going to be able to see them again. And... So that night my dad went to bed, my little boy went to bed, they were asleep, and my mom and I are more night owls, we like to stay awake, but especially because we were just up talking about everything, we were up until around 2 in the morning. But I was wide awake and alert because I'm kind of used to being up late like that. I was sitting on the end of the couch to where I could see straight down the hallway um, that le le leads to bedrooms and a bathroom. And I looked down the hallway and I saw someone, I saw this figure standing in front of the bathroom door 
and I was able to stare at it for, I don't know, a matter of seconds to where I was just like, holy, like I knew I'm seeing someone and it saw me and quickly darted over to the right into the kitchen. And it was almost as if it was like, okay, I can see, like it realized I could see and I was like, but she can see me and darted into the kitchen. And so, and there was a decorative sign hanging on the outside of the bathroom door. So when this figure moved out of the way, that sign came into view. So it's like its head was obscuring that sign. So that was another like standout thing for me that was like, okay, yes, you did see something in the contrast between the door color and this figure. It was just this black figure in front of the door and it wasn't translucent, but it was just like the shape around head and shoulders and torso. So that's the one and only time that any of us have seen anything there. Um, things escalated a bit after that with the regular things that were happening and then culminated in the 4th of, on the 4th of July, um, I went to visit my parents. We had a little cookout, which is me, mom and dad my niece and nephew and my son and at one point the kids were playing in the pool out in the yard and my parents were sitting on the porch and I had walked inside and then my parents called for me to come outside and you know ask if I had walked from the back around the front yard and I said no and they were looking around and my dad and mom had been sitting in rocking chairs on the front porch and an old paintbrush flew through the air across the porch and hit my dad. And there's just no way that that could have happened. The kids didn't do it. They were in the pool. They didn't see anyone else in the yard. Um, the way the yard, everything is, it's just not possible that someone could have done that without the kids seeing them and without my parents being able to jump up really quickly and look and see someone there and there wasn't a shelf or any place where that could have fallen off and hit my dad it just randomly a an old paintbrush flew and just hit my dad and you know we were like this is really weird is this my parents were kind of my mom's kind of worried that maybe the ghost was getting to be a little malevolent and then I said well you know when weird things, big things like this happen, it's usually been some kind of a warning. So, um, hopefully nothing bad happens. Well, later that week, my brother came to the house and he hadn't been there long and he was walking down the hallway and something that we don't even know what it is, was, flew through the air and hit him really hard in the face and actually cut, made a cut, made a mark on his face and they never could find what it was. They, my, him, my mom and dad, and just in this hallway area, they couldn't find anything. And then shortly after that, there was something that happened, um, a phone call that my parents got and, um, you know, some bad news and it had involved my brother. And so it just like this, whoever lives there, my parents call it Johnny. Um, it does seem kind of characteristic of um, what we've heard about this person, this um, local legendary guy, um, and some of the shenanigans that he got had gotten up into. So um, we feel like he, you know, is just a bit of a trickster spirit there in the house, um, and that he also looks out for my family and uh, particularly the kid, particularly the kids, and. Um, watches over them. There's a lot more stories I could tell uh, surrounding the house, but um, maybe I can save those for another time. This one takes place in New York City. When I was sharing the second floor of a town home on West 16th Street with my then partner, this townhouse we lived in had a lot of charm and a fair amount of space as far as New York City apartments go. And I guess it had accumulated its share of spirits or poltergeists or whatever you want to 
call them over the years. In any case, we had a fair number of experiences there. One year, our Christmas tree was visibly shaking all on its own, not just trembling, but shaking. And there would have been no earthquake. There was no construction happening around. There was no reason why it should have done that. But it shook for a few seconds and then stopped. That was it for that. Then one day, Stuart told me that he had heard a, a puppy whining in the living room. We didn't have a dog. No one in our building had a dog or was dog sitting at the time. So um, I just sort of raised my eyebrow at that one. Stu had a tendency to readily believe any kind of unusual or supernatural explanation for things. So I just sort of brushed that off until the next day when we were sitting at the table eating and we both heard it. And it truly was the unmistakable whine of a puppy. But then it sounded like it was coming from the kitchen. So we called to it and opened all the cabinets, looked around, couldn't find it. It stopped and we never heard it again. We also had some shenanigans with a corn shaver. And if you don't know what that is, it's a little handheld tool with a curved and mostly covered um, razor blade on the end. It's used to shave dead skin off corns on your feet. Naturally, we kept this item in the medicine cabinet in the bathroom, but there were two days in a row when I came home from work and found it on the middle of the kitchen counter. So after the second time, I said to Stu, please don't leave that corn shaver in the kitchen. It's gross and unsanitary. And he said, I hadn't touched that thing. I didn't even know we had one or even didn't remember that we'd had one. But anyway, it moved on its own one more time after that, but at least it had a decency to remain within the bathroom when it did. And after that, it behaved. But anyway, the main story I wanted to share with you happened on the day our good friend Dan died. This was the early 90s, and Dan had been suffering with AIDS for quite a while. So when we got the call about him on, uh, I think it was a Saturday afternoon, it was not unexpected, but it was, it was sad. You know, to have someone you care about have to suffer like that and then die so young. So we talked about him and thought about him, spoke to some friends on the phone about him that afternoon. Uh, some plans even were uh, started for his memorial service. But after a while, we went on with our day. And several hours later, around 10 or 11, we were in bed reading. And the only appliances that were on were a reading light, the alarm clock and the refrigerator. And the reason that's important is because however old this townhouse was, it came with its original wiring, which was not very robust. We learned early on that you didn't dare dry your hair and make toast at the same time. So we knew exactly how many appliances we could have on to avoid the fuse blowing. But of course, as you can probably surmise with me having just said that, as we're lying there, the fuse indeed blew. And we immediately groaned because it meant one of us would have to get up, walk in the dark through the living room, into the kitchen, take a new fuse out of the drawer, stand on the radiator in the bathroom to reach where this fuse was, unscrew it and screw in a new one. It wasn't all that hard to do, but it was just something you didn't want to do once you were all comfortable in bed. So Stuart said, it's your turn. So I got up and walked to the door that led to the living room, which I knew was open. And I froze. I don't know how to describe this feeling that came over me, uh, but it was an immediate and overpowering certainty that Dan was about to appear to me in the living room. And I don't know where this came from. It felt external, like it was something outside of me that, that came into me somehow. I hadn't been thinking about him at that particular moment. And you know, the fuse blowing was annoying but I and unusual because we normally wouldn't think it would blow with those few things on, but I didn't think something odd was going on. So this feeling was so unexpected. And I remember thinking, Dan, I love you, but I can't face seeing you right now. And no sooner had I thought that than from behind me, Stu in bed barks out at me, what are you doing? I guess he could hear that I had stopped walking and was wondering why. And I said, I don't know, I'm being silly. 
It was the best I could come up with at the moment. But as soon as I said that, that feeling evaporated. And I think that's the best word to use because it really felt like it just lifted and went up through the ceiling of the room. So with it gone, I changed the fuse, got back in bed, but I was still pretty shaken about it. And I didn't, I didn't want to bring it up yet. But the next morning I asked Stu why he had sounded so gruff when he asked me the night before about what was I doing? And he took a moment and then he said, he barked actually again, because I had this overwhelming sense that Dan was about to appear in the bedroom and I didn't want you to freak out. <laughs> and of course that, that was not among the things I thought he might say to me. And he had been kind of abrupt then with his answer because he thought I would respond with my usual skepticism. But of course, this time I couldn't. I told him, no, I had the exact same feeling, except I thought Dan was going to appear in the living room. I, I suppose it was our fear or our speaking or maybe both that broke the spell because Dan did not appear to Stuart in the bedroom. In fact, the feeling lifted from him at the same time it did from me. So who knows? We both felt like we almost got visited by our good friend. In any case, I, I hope our friend understood why it would be terrifying to see him in that particular way uh, and that he's at peace now. This happened, I believe it was New Year's of 2016. Um, my dad was working for our local, the city here for their New Year's festivities. So I wasn't going to be home until the wee hours of the morning and my mom didn't want to, you know, spend New Year's all alone. So I went to stay with her and I took my Ouija board because it was a perfect opportunity for her sh for the two of us to use it because my dad doesn't like to have it around so if he's not around we can use the board so anyways we're using the board had been using it for a while up to this point and um at one point um it started just randomly spelling something out over and over again it seemed and we, rather quickly and we were finally able to figure out that it was spelling Tammy Leon as if it was one word. It took us a little bit to figure it out. It was over and over and we were finally like, okay, Tammy Leon. And then, it, you know, the board just kind of calmed down. It was almost like it was in response to um, us figuring out what was being spelled out. So we continued to use the board and the spirit that we were communicating with um, told us that her name was Sue. She gave her last name and um, said that she was my dad's aunt. And at this point, my mom looked at me and said, he, your dad does not have an aunt by this name. He doesn't have an aunt Sue. So we continued to use the board. Um, I don't really remember what else that um, Sue um, told us. And so anyways, the next morning, one or the next day, when we were speaking to my dad, um, we just kind of, you know, you know, brought it. We didn't want to let him know. Oh, we were using a Ouija board because he like he really does not like to have that in his house. Um, but we kind of brought out the topic of um, his aunt Sue in a way, and um, you know, my mom said, "You never had an aunt Sue, did you?" And he was like, "Yeah, I did." And we just looked at each other and didn't say anything. And then my mom said, well, I've never heard you talking about her before. And he said, well, her name, and I cannot remember what he said her name was. I think it was like Rita Sue or something like that. And he said that the family had always called her Rita. And um, she didn't like, I think that's what it was. She didn't like that name. So when she got older to be a teenager, young adult, she started going by Sue. That she'd rather, you know, ask her. So her friends and thing you know people like that that's what they called her and he said that her husband leon always called her sue and when he said that we just looked at each other and um he said you know i never or my mom i think again said well, why did you've never told me about her i've never heard you talk about her and he said well i never really knew her she died when she was pretty young 
and I never got a chance to know her really. He said, all I know is that she was married to a man named Leon and that she had a daughter named Tammy and that he met them once or twice when he was a kid. So at this point, um, you know, me and my mom are trying to be really inconspicuous, not trying to raise any suspicions, but looking at each other like, what? Like, um, you know, eventually later on, uh, she told him about our Ouija board session and told him about that. And he just, I don't know what his response was, but it was kind of a mind blowing thing, even though I've used um, boards and I do think that we can communicate with those who've gone on. Um, that's probably the most mind blowing um, experience I've ever had with the boards. It's the only thing that I've um, communication that I've ever had where I've been able to verify um, the information that I would receive from whoever I was communicating with. So um, my mom and I have talked with her through the board um, several times after that, but um, it's been a while since we have um, been able to get in touch with Sue on the board again. My brother once lived in a flat in downtown Empty Clemens. He always told me the odd experiences he was having in that flat. Things like cupboard doors opening up, things gone missing. But one peculiar oddity was that he was always missing underwear from his drawer. He admitted that he thought his house was haunted and that the ghost had a crush on him. Never anything violent or disturbing, just odd things, later on he starts dating his future wife. She starts coming around and he notices that the oddities begin to increase. New oddities began to occur. His girlfriend would always find her shoes that she left on a mat inside the apartment at night, outside the door on the patio in the morning. She'd always comment to my brother to stop putting her shoes outside. He had an idea of why, but didn't want to frighten her. Besides, it wasn't hurting anyone, right? Well, things started getting worse. He comes home from work and his girlfriend was staying there while he was gone, claims that the stove burner kept lighting itself. She'd walked into the kitchen and it would be lit. She'd turn it off and shortly later it'd be lit again. Then, one night my brother wakes up in the middle of the night and sees his girlfriend sitting at the end of the bed, not just sees, but feels her near his feet, staring at him. He calls out for her to come back to bed. She doesn't respond, so he calls out louder telling her to come to bed and asking what's wrong. His girlfriend then asks what he's doing. He turns, and she's sleeping next to him. He turns back. No one is at the end of the bed. Now, he's freaked out, but doesn't want to scare his girlfriend from coming over his place that a few nights later. They're both sleeping, and he wakes up to his girlfriend screaming. He looks over, and she's sleeping, but thrashing around holding onto her neck. He doesn't see anything, so he starts yelling and shaking her to wake her up. After a few shakes, she wakes up crying and terrified. She starts telling my brother about how real her dream felt that a woman was strangling her telling her to get out, that she doesn't belong there, and to leave her man alone. Her neck had red marks on it, possibly from herself trying to defend herself, but they believed it to be from something else. My brother then comes clean with her. They decide to do some research and find out that the address that they lived in was an old brothel back in the day that the rich baiters used to stay in. My brother lived in that house for a few more weeks before he could locate a new place. She never came back to say the night bell, and he never experienced anything aggressive while living there. A story from New York. The Boarding House Ghost. 1909. The boarders who lived at Mrs. Mary Miller's boarding house at 147 East 16th Street in New York had been talking for some time about disturbing experiences from what they believed were caused by a ghost. The boarders would hear the sounds of thumping, which were sometimes regular and other times irregular, sometimes on the roof, sometimes in the halls. Between Mary Miller's boarding house, there was an alley. The alley also abetted a saloon, which was at the intersection of 16th Street and 3rd Avenue. This alley that sat between Mary Miller's property and the saloon was roofed over one August afternoon in 1909. 
Mrs. Miller accidentally dropped something on that roof. So she climbed out of a window on her property to fetch what she dropped. As she was climbing back into the window, she caught sight of something. It was an ash niche with a canister in it. She looked it over and decided to leave it. A short time later, Mrs. Miller told the watchman, Thomas Daunt, about what she discovered. Don reported this to the police officer of the East 22nd Street Station. The police officer went up to the roof, removed the canister, and then took it to the morgue. It was found that the canister contained the remains of Kate Bausch, who had been cremated in 1903. A background on the deceased. Kate was born in Germany in July of 1860. She moved to America in 1884. In 1887, she married Fred Bausch, who was from Germany. Fred worked as a waiter in New York and had arrived about a year before Kate. On June 14, 1888, in Manhattan, New York, the couple had a daughter and named her Bertha. By 1900, the couple with their 11-year-old daughter, Bertha, were renting an apartment at 411 East 17th Street, which was a block over from Mary Miller's boarding house mentioned earlier. Three years later, on April 18, 1903, Kate Bausch died in Manhattan, New York. She was 45. She was cremated at Middle Village, Queens County, New York. Her daughter Bertha was a month away from her 15th birthday when her mother passed. I was unable to find the cause of Kate's death, though. Back to the story. After the policemen had left Kate's ashes at the morgue, the plan was that they would remain there for a while, and if nobody claimed Kate's remains, she would be buried in Potter's Field. Why Kate's ashes were left outside a window of Mary Miller's boarding house, we'll probably never know. My first thought was that maybe after Kate died, her husband and daughter moved to Miller's boarding house and put her ashes outside so Kate could enjoy the sights and sounds of New York. But on further reading, I found another report from the watchman Daunt. He had seen the canister about four months prior, behind the bar of the saloon on the corner of 16th and 3rd. It was after hours and one of the other watchmen, Frank Dutton, showed it to him. Neither watchman could understand why the ashes of a deceased person had been left behind the bar. Their best guess was that the ashes had been left by a patron by mistake after he or she had stopped by the saloon. And then the bartender put the ashes behind the bar as a kind of lost and found. Dodd said he didn't know what Dutton had done with the ashes after that night. So perhaps it had been the watchman Dutton who had left Kate Bouch's remains on high so she would have a view of the sea. Again, I'm pretty sure we'll never know. But whoever or whatever the reason, Kate seemed to want someone to know her remains were outside. Because after Kate's ashes were moved to the morgue, the tenants never heard another ghostly sound. Kate was eventually buried at the Fresh Pond, Crematory, and Columbarium in Middle Village, Queens County, New York. Fred Bausch died two years after his wife on May 6, 1907. He was 39 and he was buried next to Kate. And it appears their daughter Bertha had been put into a boarding house situation with two people who were widowed. She went on to work as a housekeeper. And I looked up the address of Mrs. Mary Miller's boarding house at 147 East 16th Street, New York. And at this time, it's being built into a high-rise building 